1724, Emperor Yongzhun passed an edict to deport missionaries, closing China's doors and beginning a stagnant time of peace and prosperity. Soon after, the Western Industrial Revolution burst onto the scene. Producing textile machines, steam engines, aircraft, electric power, telecommunications, and railroads. Within a few decades, human civilization entered a new era. Back in isolated China, still relishing in its self-sufficient economy, society was filled with deep-rooted problems manifesting themselves through superstition, foot-binding, opium, concubines, abandoned babies, imperial examinations, and more. Facing such an ignorant, vast, and distant virgin land, some of the West found it mysterious, some reacted with disdain, and some discovered business opportunities. Christians, however, saw the thirst of 400 million souls and the call of God's love. In 1799, as the missionary movement was rapidly expanding in Britain, Robert Morrison was moved by a desire to minister overseas. Eight years later, in 1807, this shoemaker's son from Newcastle was chosen by the London Missionary Society to become the first Protestant missionary in China. And so by the time that Morrison was becoming sort of conscious of life, he was affected by this new spirit. There was a, an awakening of Christianity within England. With that, there was a growing sense of uh, passion to take the gospel. At the time, travel was beginning to open up. Uh, sea travel was becoming easier. Rail travel was just beginning. And Morrison was at one of those great uh, cultural, uh, intellectual, uh, entrepreneurial moments. It was a turning point in British society, much as we see in many parts of the world now. That was the moment, and Morrison was born into that world. At the young age of 25, Morrison cried as he left London. He wrote, I am alone. Oh, that I may not be alone, but that the good hand of my God may be upon me, and the angel of his presence go before me. He was the first one. He felt that God had called him. He himself was very uneasy. So after he got on the ship, when someone sarcastically asked, do you really expect to make an impression on the idolatry of the great Chinese empire and lead them to Christ? Morrison was initially taken aback, replying quietly, no, sir, but I believe God will. September in Guangzhou was scorching hot but Morrison's living conditions were cold as frost. The Qing dynasty had closed its doors for 50 years and prohibited Christianity for a full century. Guangzhou was the only port where foreign trade was allowed, and the activities of foreigners were limited to a small area just north of the Pearl River called the 13 Factories. Morrison's first challenge was learning Chinese. At the time, it was illegal for foreigners to learn Chinese. Any Chinese citizen teaching foreigners Chinese would be tried for treason. Morrison, at high cost, hired a fearless Chinese teacher. This teacher carried poison and was prepared to commit suicide upon discovery in order to avoid being tortured. To protect him, Morrison took lessons at night. 
The cost of living and his education in Guangzhou were very high. Morrison lived in a room in the basement of a warehouse, ate two meals a day, and eventually suffered from severe malnutrition. He also suffered from loneliness. He sent out 200 letters in one year, only to receive two responses. He said, I felt about this time somewhat depressed on account of my being quite alone, without any person whom I could call a friend. God was his only support. To encourage himself, he wrote in his diary, Be strong in the Lord, O my soul. Fear not, only believe. The firm faith gave him tenacious perseverance. Two years later, Morrison could read the four books, a set of authoritative Confucian classics. He spoke both Mandarin and Cantonese fluently. In order to reside in China legally, he accepted a translator post with the East India Company while laboring over a Chinese-English dictionary and, in his spare time, working on a translation of the Bible. Early on, some people misunderstood Morrison because he was a translator for the East India Company. But the East India Company was engaged in trade with China, which later became the sale of opium. So people say, look, this first Protestant missionary is basically involved in the imperialist culture invasion of China. This terrible East Indian Company translator selling opium to China. So the evidence is irrefutable. But at the time, the Qing government had closed off China to foreigners unless you were there for business reasons. In other words, unless you were an employee of the East India Company, there was no way to enter mainland China. Morrison abhorred the smuggling of opium by the East India Company. He wrote, This is a traffic which is far from being reputable, either to the English flag or the character of Christendom. During this period, Morrison was faced with desperate loneliness internally and endless trials externally. Together, these forces almost crushed this lone pioneer. In 1813, things finally started to turn around. Morrison married Mary Morton in Macau. At the same time, another British missionary couple, the Milnes, came to assist him. In 1814, seven years after his arrival in China, Morrison's first seed finally sprouted through this tough, hard land. On July 16th, Chai Gao, a worker who had been secretly helping with the printing of the Bible, was baptized in Macau, becoming China's first Protestant. Not long after, Chai Gao's brothers, Chai Xing and Chai San, were also baptized. In 1818, Morrison and Milne established the Anglo-Chinese College in Malacca, setting a precedent for the dissemination of Western education to China. On November 25, 1819, Morrison and Milne notified the London Missionary Society that they had completed the translation of all books in the Bible. Morrison had spent 12 years and three months translating the Bible. He wrote, I know that the labors of God's servants in the gloom of a dungeon have illumined succeeding ages, and I am cheered by the hope that my labors in my present confinement will be of some service in the diffusion of divine truth amongst the millions of China. There was a great fire in Canton in 1820. He saw his Chinese uh, neighbors showing what he saw to be complete disregard for anybody who lived around them. And that inspired him, this is the good news, to begin to think about ways he could bring in love into the way the Chinese understood the Christian faith and practical love. Very much like Wilberforce, a very clear sense of parallel, the gospel needs to be embodied, not just proclaimed.
In 1820, Morrison and Dr. John Livingston founded the first public dispensary in China to help the poor. This was a precursor to the Canton Pak Sai Hospital. In 1821, the Morrison Chapel was established in Macau. This is China's earliest Protestant church. It still stands right next to the old Protestant cemetery where the Morrisons are buried. He preached many sermons which are hugely fascinating. One of the notes you get out of that is that God loves the world. He doesn't just love the church. And he doesn't segregate. He doesn't differentiate between cultures and languages and colors and things. He loves the world. He loves people. And that was one of the great messages that Morrison brought. And he said, we shouldn't go to China to try and change the culture. We shouldn't go to China and say we're better than China. We go to love China. In 1823, Morrison completed the compilation of his dictionary titled A Dictionary of the Chinese Language. This was China's first Chinese-English dictionary, totaling 4,595 pages. Its publication was of monumental importance to Western studies of China. In the same year, Morrison ordained China's first Protestant minister, Liang Fa. Liang evangelized for 40 years, enduring imprisonment and torture, all the while remaining loyal to his faith. Morrison brought many firsts to the Chinese church and Chinese society. Beneath every little accomplishment, however, lied unimaginable sacrifices. In 1819, Half a year before the completion of the Chinese translation of the Bible, Milne's wife, Rachel, after losing two children, also died from illness. Two years later, Morrison's wife, Mary, died of cholera. 29-year-old Mary was pregnant. Morrison was overcome with grief. He wrote, I will not say, grieve not, oh no. I have shed many tears for Mary. Let us shed many tears of affectionate remembrance, for she was worthy of our love. Morrison placed his two surviving children under the care of friends and returned back to Guangzhou alone. In some of the unpublished letters that I read. There's some little handwritten notes from Morrison and he would end with sort of papa or dada to his children. And you suddenly think here is a man who to all the world was this incredibly gruff, hard-edged, extraordinarily capable, incredibly single-minded person, but actually had a very soft side. Less than two years later, Morrison's only companion, Milne, suddenly died after continuously overworking at the age of 37. Morrison wrote, Nine years ago, Mr. and Mrs. Milne were received at Macau by me and Mrs. Morrison. Three of the four, all under 40, have been called hence and have left me alone and disconsolate. But good is the will of the Lord. They all died in the faith and hope of the gospel all died at their post. Happy am I that none of them deserted it. During this period, at Morrison's request, many churches prayed for him, asking for God to be gracious to him, to be gracious to the Chinese people, to extend the years of the world's only missionary fluent and proficient in Chinese. After Milne's death, Morrison continued to evangelize in China for 11 years. On July 30, 1834, Morrison 
who had suffered from chronic headaches, fell ill in Guangzhou. He died the night of August 1st at the age of 52. Morrison's body was escorted by his eldest son, John Robert Morrison, to Macau, where he was buried beside his wife, Mary. Morrison was in China for 27 years, during the most difficult phase of breaking new ground for the Chinese Protestant Church. Only 10 Chinese locals were baptized. One year after Morrison passed away, his son John and pastor Elijah Bridgman co-wrote a letter reporting that the first Chinese Protestant church had been established in Guangzhou, with 12 members in total. 